Despite its current status as one of the greatest westerns, The Magnificent Seven was a disaster in the making. Had it been filmed in Hollywood, it would never have got off the ground. It would have been just another casualty of that year's actor strike. But moving the shoot to Mexico proved a difficult option. The Mexican government objected to the way Mexicans were portrayed in the film and came close to shutting it down. Director John Sturgis wasn't the first choice. He was third, and even then he tried to quit. The finished film pleased nobody. Not the studio, not the critics, and not the public. The studio demanded 15 minutes be cut, and when that wasn't carried out, the film was denied a premiere. It was shunted out, state by state, in the kind of release pattern normally reserved for exploitation pictures of the here-today, gone-tomorrow variety. Word of mouth didn't have a hope of building up. In New York at that time, major films opened in a first-run house around Times Square. The Magnificent Seven did not. It was relegated to Brooklyn. Critics didn't like it, nor did the public. It was a box office flop. In fact, it did so poorly that it was sold prematurely to television. But then something strange happened. By the mid-1960s, it acquired an all-star cast. In 1960, Steve McQueen was little more than a rising television star. By 1966... He was a big box office star after The Great Escape and The Sand Pebbles. In 1960, James Coburn had merely been at another wannabe, but after Our Man Flint in 1966, he too achieved stardom. Horse Picoults had received top billing in a string of pictures. Robert Vaughan, another relative unknown, now had a global following as television's The Man from Uncle. And Charles Bronson was on the verge of stardom, after breakthrough roles in The Great Escape and The Battle of the Bulge. So even though the film had been shown in television, it was reissued in a double bill with the sequel, Return of the Seven. There would be two more sequels, and each time they appeared, so did the original. The sequels followed the rules of diminishing returns, but that didn't happen to the original. Revenues kept growing for The Magnificent Seven, so much so that it achieved the virtually impossible feat of making more money from its reissues than on initial launch. And by then it had become recognised as a Western masterpiece. More than that, it had become iconic. It had the man in black, Yul Brynner, and Mr Cool, Steve McQueen. The taciturn Charles Bronson and the monosyllabic James Coburn offered a different kind of sidekick. It was seen as the link between the old West of John Ford and Howard Hawks and the new more violent West of Sergio Leone and Sam Peckinpah. In previous westerns, cowboys raced to the rescue out of love for a woman, out of revenge, or out of a sense of duty. Never for anything as shabby as money. But this was a more realistic example of the genre. Mavericks had been driven to the borders of civilization, where they hoped to escape the past. Instead, it caught up with them. Down here, when the law-abiding were confronted by the lawless, they no longer went straight to the lawman. Instead, they hired mercenaries. For an action-packed western, The Magnificent Seven begins with a piece of such subtlety that you probably won't notice it. The credits appear over what looks like a tableau. Mountains in the background, ricks of corn in the foreground. At the end of the credits, the tableau comes to life. A tiny figure walks out from behind a corn stack. A few seconds later, tiny horsemen, the Mexican bandits about to terrorise the village, enter from the opposite side of the frame. This is a far more subtle picture than generally given credit for. Although the protagonists often verbalise their intentions, it's the visual that gives away hidden emotions. Charles Bronson hands a child a whistle. Steve McQueen looks wistfully at women doing the laundry. Robert Vaughan braces his back against a wall to avoid combat. A young female villager displays her true feelings for horse pecoles, by soundlessly dumping food on his plate. It is a violent film that questions the nature of violence, whether being a gunman is fulfilling or self-destructive. It's a film about standing up or giving in. The young Bacolts idolises the gunfighters, but the gunfighters themselves are a disillusioned bunch. Their calling has brought them neither wealth, roots nor satisfaction. When we first encounter Yul Brynner and Steve McQueen, they're drifters, and impoverished at that. 
Charles Bronson chops logs to pay for his breakfast. Robert Vaughan is on the run and behind the rent for his room. Only James Coburn appears self-sufficient. But they're also poor. They're willing to take on a job lasting six weeks for a paltry 20 bucks. They might have a code of honour, but then again they might not. Mexican bandit chief Eli Wallach sees them as no different to himself. The villagers fear them as much as the bandits, to the extent of hiding away their women. Of the seven, Brinder and Coburn are the only two willing to stick to the letter of their original contract. The climax of the film might appear to be the battle royal at the end, but in fact the emotional high point has taken place some time earlier. That's when the gunfighters take inventory of their lives. What do they have? Nothing. No wives, no children, no homes. The film is surprisingly full of twists and turns. The bandit leader is far more affable, a benevolent dictator, than such a role normally demands. And he's pretty savvy, so that at points the movie becomes a game of cat and mouse. The villagers go from despising the gunmen to hailing them as heroes to betraying them again. The seven gunmen trap the bandits, only to be trapped in turn. And it's all held together with terrific verve. The tracking camera has never been better used. As well as two knock em dead battles, there are several outstanding scenes. Brenner and McQueen team up to help bury a dead Native American. The quick draw skills of Bacolks are tested against the speed of Brenner's hand clap, and there is the knife throwing expertise of James Coburn. Most movies don't waste time introducing secondary characters, but in taking all the time in the world, Sturges gives the audience investment in these men. Action supplies all we need to know about Brenner, McQueen and Coburn. Brad Dexter is established as the greedy one. Young Bacolch, the one most likely to get his head blown off. Only the shifty Robert Vaughan and the inscrutable Charles Bronson remain mysterious. The movie stuck roughly to the source material, The Seven Samurai, which was made in 1954. But the Magnificent Seven lacked its epic running time of three and a half hours. Cutting the film back to a trim of two hours created a western with its own rules. Yul Brynner, dressed all in black, chomping on a cigar and striding around as if he owned the place. But at the same time he displayed the world weariness of his profession. McQueen brought a new kind of persona to the screen. Coburn's easy lope and self-assurance made him stand out. Tough guy Bronson proved he had a heart. Bacolch and Robert Vaughan had the hardest parts. Bacolch had to move from immaturity to responsibility and shoulder the picture's sole romance. Vaughan was on the edge of a nervous breakdown. At the time, if you recognised the terrific job director John Sturgis had done in marrying action with the psychological and the philosophical. Sturgis was something of a Western specialist. Six of his last ten films had been westerns, including Gunfight at the O.K. Corral in 1957 with Burt Lancaster and Kurt Douglas. But The Magnificent Seven was without doubt his masterpiece. He moved the camera with aplomb. He allowed time for characters to develop. He used that time to build up tension. And he handled the big action set pieces with the skill of a battle master. And no mention of the film would be complete without acknowledging the extending music of Elmer Bernstein. Despite its disappointing reviews and equally disappointing box office, The Magnificent Seven truly enjoyed a Hollywood ending. It spawned three sequels, a television series, a remake and countless cinema reissues and television repeats. If not recognised by the critics as the best western ever made, it is the one that has resonated most with the general public. On its 60th anniversary, it stands alone as the most popular western of all time. If you're interested in learning more about the battle to get this film made, the filming itself and its release, then my book, The Making of the Magnificent Seven, is available in Kindle and Amazon.